VHS Viral is the type of movie to look at the previous VHS movies and go, let's do that again, but worse. The original two movies were no masterpieces on their own, but certainly contain their fair share of diamonds. Like Amateur Night, A Ride in the Park, and Safe Haven. We do love our prego cults around here. It's just that the third one, being VHS Viral, has more in common with a viral infection than it does a good viral internet video. And much like the previous two installments, it cuts back and forth between interludes connecting the tapes. And by connecting the tapes, I mean it has no connection whatsoever, and things just kinda happen. And by things just kinda happening, I present to you this video's sponsor. <laughs> got ya. Thanks to Raid Shadow Legends for sponsoring today's video. Explore millions of champion combinations and master countless tactics as you take on the raid bosses, dungeon runs, campaign battles, and PvP arena matches, all from the comforts of your mobile or desktop device. Most games will have something challenging waiting for you at the end, something for you to really master. Well in Raid, that end game is the Doom Tower. To climb to the top, you're going to need an army of champions. The regular Doom Tower floors tend to be pretty easy to deal with if you've got the right team. But the bosses are really tough, and you'll need some serious specialists if you're going to beat them. You'll want to remove debuffs and have a pretty high resistance to deal with the challenges that await you within, because these bosses are no joke. This month, Rage just released a new feature, Awakening and a brutal new dungeon, the Iron Twins Fortress. If you take down the Iron Twins, you'll see a huge payoff, being able to awaken your champions. Awakening lets you choose a powerful blessing that can transform how they perform in battle. Rage just released a super-powered legendary version of the champion Death Knight, something that the community has been waiting for for a long time. He's poised and he's powerful, and the best part is, everyone can get him for free. Just log in and play Raid for 7 days between now and October the 27th, and you'll get Ultimate Death Knight. You can also use the code DKRISES for a bunch of free items to instantly level your new strongest champion all the way to level 50 and a 5 star ascension. So new players, use my link or scan the QR code and get a free starter pack worth almost $30, a free champion Virgis, and this in-game loot. You'll find your rewards here in your inbox for the next 30 days only. Because these interludes just kind of exist out in the open with very little purpose in this world, Kinda like me. I'm going to group it together and go through each part of the interlude first as if it was its own short movie. Because that's exactly what it is. A short movie. What I'm trying to say is that it doesn't matter, because Dollar Store Scotch Tape would do a better job at connecting these short films together than what these interludes do. The previous two movies didn't do too much in terms of connecting the stories, but at the very least showed them putting the tapes in the VHS player. You know, like when your newly dead girlfriend is laying on the floor and she's just released the contents of her bowels all over the place as her muscles have gone limp. The perfect time to watch a movie. The interlude is named Vicious Circles, directed by Marcel Sarmiento. The circles being vicious because they keep coming back around to interrupt the movie when I care very little about it. The tape begins with a guy named Kevin filming his girlfriend Iris. He seems to have somewhat of an obsession with filming her, as it starts off innocently enough with her really liking the attention, but quickly devolving to the point of it being annoying and inappropriate, as he cosplays as the cameraman from a found footage movie and absolutely refuses to put the camera down no matter what. It cuts to Kevin filming the TV, as a nearby police pursuit involving an ice cream truck is about to go right past his house. Kevin runs outside and misses it, right as a group of people ride past on their bikes following the chase on their own. And after receiving a rather strange video on her phone, Iris calmly walked out of the house in a daze, most likely after doing what Kevin just did, walking in on his grandma wearing her flesh suit, and she stands in the middle of the road. And we then see this great valiant police officer who works in law enforcement, despite clearly being deaf, suddenly gets hit by this loud speeding ice cream truck that there's absolutely no way he couldn't have heard, and Iris seems to have completely peaced out. Kevin then notices that he's receiving the strange video message too, and takes off after the ice cream van, because he sure could use a nice refreshing popsicle after watching the insides of a police officer paint the sidewalk. The police, really wanting a Cornetto, are still trying but miserably failing to bring this van to a stop, as we then see a group of people chilling on top of a random bridge, because I guess that's where all the cool kids hang out these days, and they watch as the pursuit is coming their way, followed by the bikers and then Kevin. Someone clearly thought they had god mode enabled, as they decide to take a little tumble over the bridge and are then run over by one of the bikers for good measure. Kevin catches up with them to tell them that the ice cream truck is going around in circles and snatching people up, before the ice cream truck goes around in a circle and snatches a people up. One of the bikers is being dragged behind the truck as it drives down the road and is being torn to shreds in the process, as if his feet are a block of cheese and the concrete floor is the cheese grater. The man's mangled foot comes flying off, and another rider, absolutely disgusted by the thought of a foot fetish, decides that he'd rather just fall over and die. Death by foot. 
Kyle continues to chase the van, as it then cuts to a group of people having a barbecue while celebrating a friend's release from prison. And if this movie series has taught us anything about barbecues, it's that everybody is going to be horrifically unalived. Yep, there it is. As the police helicopter flies overhead, desperately attempting to track down an in-transit seller of frozen dairy goods, it causes everyone at the party to become increasingly paranoid, until someone decides that the best possible course of action to do right now is to thrust a large barbecue fork into a dog's head. Because sure, why wouldn't you think that's the best thing to do right now? As everyone but the dog's owner is laying on the floor with various different pieces of cutlery protruding from their bodies, the person filming this master chef at work suddenly collapses due to a leaking gas canister and the whole place explodes, turning this into a barbecued barbecue. Kyle chases after a car to try and flag it down for help, as we see a nice respectable man sitting in the back of it, creating a nice little home video to show the kids one day. The woman he's filming asks him if she knows who she is, before then pulling out a gun and making him undress instead. Apparently the man filming had bought footage from her ex-boyfriend and published it online for the whole world to see. The type of footage that you wouldn't want your nan to watch. He pounces and starts to strangle her as he's managed to take the upper hand, but suddenly a literal flying police car comes zooming through the air, as if it's Elon Musk's new X-Wing Tesla hybrid and crashes headfirst into the police car, because I guess that's just the type of movie we're watching. Kyle reaches a tunnel littered with cell phones and emerges to find the ice cream truck surrounded by body parts and various different limbs scattered around the floor. Because apparently this one dude on a bike is able to catch up with the van and the police are absolutely nowhere to be seen. Well, I guess they're too busy flying through the air. He checks the back of the van to find it full of TVs and as he enters, the doors shut behind him and Iris appears on the TV. She directs him towards an upload switch and tells him to flick it, but somehow he seems to know that uploading the videos is a bad thing, despite his only ever interaction with the video being him looking at his phone for about three seconds and never mentioning it again. I guess all the chaos outside is supposed to be linked to the videos too, so somehow he must know that, despite having no interactions with anyone affected by it. And it doesn't really do a good job of conveying that to the viewer either. He just sort of left to assume bad things are happening because of the videos, because we saw this one dude look at his phone and then get a bloody nose. To get him to flip the switch, Iris proceeds to repeatedly slam her head against the wall, causing Iris to lose an iris, because now one of her eyes are gone. So he flips the switch, and we see the tapes from the previous movies begin to upload, giving the populace hours of binge-worthy content to watch. And when he exits the van, he finds Iris sitting against it missing an eyeball and with her phone in her mouth. He pulls the phone out, and the air must be dry, as he too begins to get a nosebleed, and then the movie comes to an end. Except it doesn't end, because somehow three short movies were sandwiched into this, despite there being absolutely no rhyme or reason anywhere to transition into them. So that being said, Dante the Great, directed by Greg Bishop. This one's not strictly a found footage movie, as it's framed as a documentary that cuts back and forth between home footage, police interrogations, interviews and news reports. What is this, a JCS video or something? It begins with a police detective and a woman named Scarlet, an assistant for a magician known as Dante the Great. He cuts to footage of a SWAT raid being carried out on his property, where they then find a hidden camera and several tapes, Dante's foot fetish collection. We then see that two years prior, Dante wasn't Dante, but a guy named John McMullen living in a trailer park and barely getting by. And somehow during that time, he came into possession of a cloak once owned by Harry Houdini. And after getting access to the cloak, he was then raised into stardom almost overnight, as it allowed him to possess great magical abilities. From lifting people out of the crowd, pickpocketing people from hundreds of yards away, and skinning animals alive. You know, the fun stuff. But after a while, it became apparent to Dante that this cloak needed to be fed. And it wasn't exactly the biggest fan of Lucky Charm cereal. It preferred its snacks to be more of the living female variety. So shortly after learning this, people close to him began to go missing as this misogynistic piece of fabric was getting greedy. He hands it to a woman in a shower and it proceeds to get a little too touchy-feely. He places it over a woman as she sleeps and it rather rudely wakes her up by throwing her all over the room. Oh yeah, and Dante records all of this because he has a big brain. Dante would then meet Scarlet and their relationship would begin to form. And after finding out about Scarlet's abusive ex-boyfriend, Dante decides that it'd be a great idea to film himself abducting the man and breaking all of his bones. Because apparently the idea of prison really appeals to Dante. Scarlet would end up finding the rather self-incriminating tapes, and in complete disbelief of how someone so powerful could be so stupid, decides to hand them into the police. Dante's arrested during an interview, and after being placed in the back of a police car, teleports out of it using no clip, and handcuffs the officer to the steering wheel. 
As Scarlet's being told by the interviewing officer that there's no such thing as magic, she suddenly pulls through the back of her chair and disappears in something that looks remarkably similar to magic. The documentary crew were secretly filming the pair, and as the police arrive once again, they're thwarted by Dante's aggressive finger pointing, as well as being thrown across the room and quite literally inverted. Dante's eventually shot, but as the officer goes to investigate his body, he learns that Dante switched positions with someone else and now he's got the gun. But as he's switched, he's left the cape on the floor, causing Scarlet to take it, as well as his weapon. They begin fighting for it, but Dante keeps making the mistake of allowing Scarlet to be close enough to grab the cape. When he's already proven countless times over that he could easily blink her out of existence, or better yet, use the effective finger pointing technique for maximum coolness. But nope, using a technique that he previously taught her, she ties his ankles together with a rope and sends him into the cloak to be consumed. Then she has a little cry about it. After filming herself burning the cloak, it cuts to webcam footage of her late at night, and we see the closet light turn on behind her. And as she goes to investigate the Paranormal Activity 2 electric boogaloo, she finds the cloak hanging on the back of the door before this rather touchy-feely cape gets all touchy-feely and reaches out for a nice little snuggle. Which leads us on to the next tape, Parallel Monsters, directed by Nachel Vigalando, as it begins in Spain with an inventor named Alfonso and his wife Marta. After she leaves his workshop, he turns on a device, closes the shutters, and the room begins to fill up with smoke. And once the shutters open, a passageway is revealed. A passageway to the exact same room that he's currently in, with an alternate version of himself. Hang on. Does it count as incest if it's they have a conversation with each other and discover that their lives are the same? So after learning this, decide to spend the next 15 minutes in each other's universe. Because what's more riveting than doing everything exactly the same, but in a different place? But after leaving the room, one of the Alfonsos immediately notices a difference. A picture on the wall depicting some kind of ritualistic setting with markings on the ground and something in a blood-soaked bag. In other words, a really good time. And the other Alfonso, in the exact same spot, finds a picture of Alfonso and Marta on their wedding day and finds it to be weird that they do something like that. He's more of a free-spirited kind of dude. Alfonso in the demonic universe, which is what I'm going to be calling it now because what else could you call that, can hear the sound of an adult film being played and is greeted by Marta opening a bottle of champagne. See, I told you it was a good time. He walks into the garden to be greeted by a man named Oriole, before another man named Oriole appears too. Oh, they're going to make an Oriole sandwich. They go back into the house to find the scene that was depicted in the photo with candles and a bloody bag, all while the sounds of an adult film plays and the video of someone being burnt on a cross is played on the TV. So a really, really good time then. After sitting and being told that Alfonso likes to go first, he just kind of sits there all confused, contemplating the possible usage for a random blood bag and two topless dudes. So with Alfonso not really doing anything, the two guys feel weirded out and decide to leave. Sure, because Alfonso's the weirdest thing in that room. An increasingly loud noise accompanied by a flashing light can be heard outside, which seems to freak Alfonso out as Marta sits there calmly, confused about what's going on with him. So he heads outside to see a blimp flying overhead with a neon upside down cross on the side of it. He's then confronted by the two men who don't seem to like being filmed. The men, now with their faces lit up as if someone's put an incredibly powerful torch in their mouth, knock the camera to the floor and begin to chase after him. Once they have him confronted, one of the men begin to remove his trousers to reveal some kind of demonic hairy pecker with sharp teeth, as the Alfonso in the other universe does the exact same thing while standing over a sleeping martyr. Talk about a trouser snake. But using his screwdriver, Alfonso gives the man's trouser demon an impromptu piercing and sprints back towards the house. Marta, seemingly excited by the blood, removes her robe to reveal that she too has some sort of demonic creature going on, so Alfonso punches her in the face because how dare she flash her demonic coochie at him. As he opens the device back to his universe, the other Alfonso appears covered in blood, plunges his screwdriver into the returning Alfonso's leg. As Demon Crotch Alfonso walks back into his universe, he's attacked by Demon Crotch Marta, as her demonic looking parts jitter all around and dance looking all, um, excited like. She tells him that she's exercising her right to execute the law on domestic violence in the home and eats him with her demon Gina. Talk about getting eaten out. After closing the passageway, Alfonso calls out to Marta as she slowly makes her way over to him covered in blood. Wielding a knife and thinking that her husband's packing a demon dong, she plunges it into him and the tape comes to an end. And I'm left here thinking, did I really just watch that? Yes I did, and now you have too. The final tape is Bone Storm, directed by Justin Benson and Aaron Scott Moorhead. It begins with a videographer named Tyler, hired by two friends, Jason and Danny, to film their skate stunts. But it quickly becomes quite obvious that Taylor's pushing them towards increasingly dangerous stunts in an attempt to film their death for profit. 
But as Danny lands the trick, Jason fires off shots into the air, because you know, screw those pigeons. And after filming a few more shots, with Taylor clearly trying to get them killed, they head to the skate park to record some more footage. Taylor suggests that they head up to Tijuana after hearing about a good spot, so decides to get his friend Sean to tag along, nicknamed Gas Money Kid by the others. They reach the spot to come across the unusual sight of shrines, dead animals and markings on the floor, in other words, everything you need for an awesome party, while Jason accidentally cuts his arm, and as the blood leaks onto the markings, it begins to boil. They then notice a woman who's just suddenly appeared from nowhere, as well as someone else, standing on the embankment chanting something. Taylor offers the strange woman a hand, which she takes quite literally and pulls it off him, before more people begin to approach. So Jason pulls out his weapon, but they don't seem to be phased by it. And once they get closer, all hell breaks loose as a full-blown assault is underway, with boards cracking skulls and bullets cracking chests. Danny and Jason begin fighting for their lives, and as the blood meets the markings on the floor, it lights them up and engulfs Taylor in a fiery inferno. Danny takes one of their swords and starts cutting them up with it, as we see Gas Money Kid get killed and dragged away into the sewers. And after killing most of the attackers with their boards, glass bottles and bits of bone, Danny cracks the singing man over the head and then proceeds to crack him some more. You must really not like that song. Once they've managed to kill all of their attackers, a loud noise is heard coming from the sewer pipe and the dead begin to rise. Danny and Jason then take off in the opposite direction to be greeted by two skeleton creatures running their way. And after beating them with skateboards, Jason sets them alight with some good old fashioned Mexican fireworks, aka grenades, and after saving Danny by blowing two more of them up, they take off on their skateboards. Danny comes to a stop due to a chunk of zombie viscera stuck in his wheels, and we see another large group appear behind them. It then cuts back to the drain pipe as it suddenly explodes and something large emerges. Okay, who flushed the demon down the toilet? It picks up the somehow still alive but well done Taylor, and very quickly makes him not alive by eating him, and the tape comes to an end. Leaving me feeling like I wish I could be eaten by some kind of giant demon sewer creature, because I'm sure that would be a much better fate than having to sit through this. Look, the original two movies were certainly no masterpieces all around, but like I said, did have their moments, and were somewhat related through an interesting interlude story. But this one takes a story about someone really wanting an ice cream, and crams three stories into it, one of which isn't even a horror. Before this comes to an end, I'd just like to give a big shout out to all the people who signed up for the newly enabled YouTube membership feature, as well as all my patrons. If you're interested in uncensored videos, behind the scenes content and custom emojis to use on the channel, maybe consider either checking out becoming a YouTube member, or signing up to the Patreon. So that being said, a big thank you to the new YouTube members, Billy Bad Cables, Cal Ballinger, Tony Kidson, Laurie Resendez, and Grumpy Old Man. And another big thank you to my patrons too. Thank you Dom, Hunters263, Rebecca Pitts, A Dandy in Space, Martin Brannan, Natasha Twyman, Jared C. Bees, Pascal Mathis, Fighting the Pirates, Richard McGowan III, Macy J, Chris, Dennis, Wade Knott, Ashley L. Wince, Christopher Budsky, Joshua Torres, Remy, Fire Goes Fast, Josh Brooks, Dyreem, Robert Zirwek, Dark Shiva, Josh Hannon, Billy Whitaker, Lonif, Jay Slows, Daniel Dickinson, Donnie Do Work, G Source, Fatty Ghost, Miguel, Owen, Curtis, Mackenzie Riley, and Reese Knight Cole. So, once again, a big thank you to all of the YouTube members and patrons, and thank you to everyone else for watching.